All right, my name is uh, Blaine Gardner. I work for SUSE with our enterprise storage division. Uh, I'm specifically working on Ceph containerization, and uh, that primarily means Rook. Uh, I'm one of the maintainers for Rook's Ceph backend. Uh, and I, I want to talk about what it's like to get started uh, as a developer on Rook's Ceph backend. Because um, I know it can be daunting, and I don't want that to keep anyone out from you know, uh, com committing and contributing where they would like to. Uh, OK, there we go. So there's like this desert to get through before you know, we can actually start working on Rook. Uh, we have Kubernetes and Rook and Ceph. And uh, all that can be a little intimidating. So I'm hoping we can get to the other side of all this together. Um, being here, I think we're all probably familiar with Ceph itself. Uh, but maybe not everyone is as familiar with Kubernetes or Rook as they would like to be, even after all of these talks. Um, there's also you know, something that I won't really touch on at all, is there's kind of a prerequisite on understanding basic container uh, concepts as well, like Docker or, or what have you. Um, so briefly, just kind of talking about some high-level Kubernetes concepts. Um, we have manifests. And these are uh, definitions which, as a person, I would write in YAML that define what a resource looks like in Kubernetes. Uh, Rook will define these uh, using uh, Golang structures and use the Kubernetes API directly. Uh, there are also pods, which are, are our unit of work in Kubernetes. And they consist of one or more containers running sequentially or uh, side by side. Uh, we have config maps and secrets, which pretty simply store uh, small bits of data persistently uh, for configuration. Uh, secrets are good for you know, things that you don't want exposed to the outside world, uh, like your uh, authentication keys and things like that. We also have, th I mean, Kubernetes has many pod controllers, but the three that we're mostly concerned with are daemon sets, and these uh, control uh, deployment of a particular pod. And generally, this can be one or more instances of the pod. Uh, jobs are more or less just a deployment, which is run to completion. It's not restarted once, uh, once the job is finished. And then there are daemon sets, which are used for running a pod on the entirety of uh, a, a subset of Kubernetes nodes. And then Kubernetes may scale up or down those pods, uh, depending on the nodes that are available. Custom resource definitions are also important for us. And these allow us to define uh, essentially a custom manifest uh, for any arbitrary resource that we can imagine. Uh, the core root concepts are going to be uh, the concept of an operator itself, which was a term coined by CoreOS uh, a few years ago. And it's essentially just an application that runs in Kubernetes and helps the administrator to operate uh, a thing, which in our case is going to be Ceph. And uh, the operator effectively just augments uh, Kubernetes's capabilities to Better, to better understand how um, to better help Kubernetes control that application's unique domain. And Ceph is definitely a unique domain. Uh, there's also a distinction that I would like to make between Rook and between Rook, what, I, what I've called Rook Ceph here. Uh, so Rook is not in, in and of itself an operator. Rook is uh, an operator framework used for creating uh, for creating individual operators. Uh, and uh, Ceph is one of these operators. There's other, other in-tree operators as well in the upstream project. Um, I'm going to do my best to always call the operator the operator or Rook Ceph. But when I inevitably slip up and say Rook, 
I almost always mean uh, the, the operator itself for Ceph in our case. There's also the Ceph Orchestrator's Manager module. And that is, uh, uh, it in short, gives us an interface, uh, an API, and a CLI for communicating with an orchestrator, whether that's Ansible or DeepC or Rook. And because we're focusing on Rook, uh, there's also the Rook Orchestrator plugin, uh, which will translate those API commands or those CLI commands into a domain the orchestrator understands. Um, I, I think it's important to go over the architecture of Rook so that we all kind of have an idea of what, like what we are actually working on. Uh, and I, I like to do that by running through what a deployment looks like and talking about the, the different parts sort of piecewise. And that's starting with, uh, from scratch, we have a deployment of the Rook Ceph operator. And uh, that's going to be shown in blue. And at this point, we also create our custom resource definition for Ceph. And with that custom resource definition, we will then create a manifest for that, which Rook will pick up from Kubernetes. And it will start creating our Ceph cluster. Um, our starting point is always just a seed cluster of a monitor and a manager. And once that is created, uh, we're also going to create a, a toolbox pod. And this toolbox pod uh, really just gives us easy access to the Ceph CLI. This is more or less the official place to use Ceph C Ceph's CLI tools. Uh, and we're going to do that by now using this uh, orchestrator module, where we can list and add hosts. We can add monitors. Uh, we can list disks in the cluster and add those disks. And we can also add other daemons as we see fit. Uh, there's way more information here than I can go through with. Uh, you can watch Sebastian's presentation from yesterday. Uh, or there's good documentation also on Ceph's website. Uh, but the first part is adding more monitors, because we want a, a better cluster than just you know, a single monitor. And so Rook will go through and it will create these monitors. It will place them on separate nodes, so to, to help us with our failure domain. And these monitors are run as deployments. From there, we can list and uh, create OSDs. Rook will uh, start up a, uh, Rook will create OSD pre preparation jobs. And these will, are run. Uh, as jobs on whichever hosts we have disks on. And this is a separate Rook executable uh, to help manage the complexity of pre preparing all of the OSDs on a host uh, sort of all at once. And this Rook, Rook executable does have access to Ceph utilities. Uh, but I, like, I wanted to separate this out logically as um, like this is primarily a Rook component first. Uh, and a, with Ceph tools. So once our OSD preparation is done uh, with the new cluster, that would be like with uh, Ceph volume now, those prepare jobs will stop, the pods will end and uh, uh, be deleted, and then uh, we are running an individual deployment for every OSD in the cluster. And this, this constitutes our core Ceph cluster here. And uh, I think this is a good time to mention that uh, I mentioned the auth keys for all of these are stored as Kubernetes secrets. Uh, and that way, you know, malicious users wouldn't just have arbitrary access to those. And from here, uh, it's kind of up, more up to the user to decide what they want to do. Uh, Generally, creating daemons is the next step. These may be one, or it may be many. Uh, the Rados gateway, in particular, may be a daemon set, which is run across a, a slew of different nodes, uh, compared to the MDS, which is going to start probably as one deployment. And it may scale up occasionally, but it all, we almost never would want it to scale down. <laughs> 
and this is also once we have our uh, our gateways set up, whether that's NFS or or whatever, uh, our users user applications can then make requests for that data to Kubernetes, uh, which then uh, communicates with Rook to understand how those applications can use the underlying Ceph storage. So Rook doesn't sit in the data path at all. Uh, Rook will just tell Kubernetes effectively how applications can be connected to Ceph. And these applications might be something like a containerized OpenStack. And then we're living our hyperconverged future that we've all dreamed of for many, many years. Um, so I'm just kind of pausing here to show kind of the end result. I think it's also good, once, once we've talked about the actual architecture of Rook, to just peek at some of the larger portions of the code. So the big long path here at the top has some of our example manifests for creating the Rook operator, uh, for creating Ceph clusters, uh, file block object storage. Uh, these are pretty straightforward. Uh, the command directory is where we actually have our entry points, or what, I've, what I call entry points at least for the Rook operator and for uh, any related components. Uh, primarily, the related component is that OSD preparation uh, pod. And package contains the vast majority of, of Rook's actual code. We have uh, the API is uh, more or less just definitions for the structures underlying our Ceph custom resource. We also have daemon Ceph, and uh, code under the daemon umbrella is generally uh, dealing with those related components. Uh, like I said, primarily the OSD preparation job. And under the operator umbrella, is where most of our core logic lives. And so these are things that are, are only run within the context of the operator. These aren't, uh, there's no code here for related components. And our operator, whenever it wants to, whenever it wants to run Ceph, it will configure a, a, a deployment, for example, to run a pod which We'll call cephmon makefs, and then we'll proceed to run the cephmon binary afterwards. Or for the OSD preparation, it will instead of uh, it will call one of the endpoints defined in command, and so that's how Rook can call code that is within itself uh, for running other things. And tests is the high-level directory where all of the integration tests are located. Uh, unit tests are all immediately right next to the code that it, it tests. Uh, before moving on too far, uh, I wanted to talk about community involvement. Uh, first and foremost, the Ceph community calendar has pretty much everything uh, as far as upstream coordination, you would want to listen in on or you know, get started with actually talking about information. The key items you're looking for here are bolded, the community meeting, the orchestrator weekly meeting, and then we have a daily-ish uh, huddle meeting. Also, the Rook Slack, uh, the Ceph Dev channel, and the GitHub are really great places to start. And I, I promise I'll bring this up later. Uh, but now actually talking about, once we understand what Rook is, how, what's the actual flow for development? And we've got a, we're going to start with our, we'll set up a virtual cluster or maybe a real cluster if you're feeling particularly bold. Uh, and then we're going to install Kubernetes on it. Most, uh, I mean, a lot of that could be left up to the user if they so desired. Uh, once those first two steps are done, you generally don't have to revisit those. And then there are separate workflows for Rook uh, for 
Ceph. And then there, I, I would also call the upgrade workflow, which is kind of a combination of both of those separate. That's also something that's sufficiently complicated and not something I think everyone needs to do right off the bat that we're going to skip that in this talk. But starting with the, uh, starting with the Rook workflow, we, uh, it starts with building whatever changes you've made to Rook. And we'll specify that we only want to build the Ceph component. So that'll save us a little bit of build time. And then we're going to. Uh, push that container to all of our nodes, which is going to be, I mean, if you're using the Docker tools at least, you're going to Docker save into a tarball. You'll SCP that to your hosts, and then you will Docker load that tarball, tarball from each of those hosts. Uh, then you will install Rook with whatever manifests you, uh, you need to. And uh, you can, I, I do a lot of manual testing myself. You can also run integration tests uh, individually, uh, generally, because those will take about five minutes to run uh, using the, there's a binary that's created when you build Rook that's called integration. And then you can pick a test with a regular expression. Or if you want to run all of them, it'll take 30, 40, maybe 45 minutes, um, you know, if you want to go to lunch or whatever. The Ceph workflow looks pretty similar. Um, we're going to do our make build. We're going to build the containers themselves. Uh, this is a bit of a different process from Rook. We can make Ceph containers ourselves from scratch. Uh, but probably the better way is to take a version of Ceph that is similar to what we're working on and uh, sort of inject our built binaries on top of that container as a layer. Um, because as long as, our, as long as we aren't using new versions of the underlying libraries, glib, c, or whatever, uh, that should work just fine. Uh, we'll then push those images the same way with the, the uh, docker save, scp, docker load. And then we'll install Rook and the Ceph cluster manifest uh, the same way as before. Uh, iteration with Ceph is generally easiest just by uninstalling Rook and starting it up again. Uh, you could delete the Ceph cluster and have Rook still run, uh, but practically speaking, it's, it's easiest just to start fresh. And for, for practical development, I spent some time the past few weeks upstreaming the development environment that I've been using for the past uh, year, I guess. And you can find that at this repository here. I've called it dev Rook Ceph. Uh, and this is primarily based around make files for user operation and libvirt for the virtualization of the cluster behind it. Uh, there's a make quick start target, which, at least on my laptop, uh, gets a three node cluster going with Kubernetes ready for Rook in about six minutes. And this also has uh, po security policies enabled within Kubernetes. Uh, primarily because it's important to me to run an environment that is closer to what you know any of the users in production are going to be using. Uh, it's also tunable. Uh, the common things being like node count or Kubernetes version, uh, along with r really it, it's it's very flexible. Um, and I. My hope is that this environment is helpful to everyone. Even if it's not, I think that code speaks, and I hope, I hope that can be useful in and of itself. Uh, I do want to introduce, uh, sorry, wrong talking point. Uh, just a brief overview here of the targets uh, in, in that repository. Uh, I have something for setting configuration, especially because of those security policies. It's, I like to just freeze a configuration in place that I'll use for all of my root code changes. Uh, there's a target for building and pushing automatically, or building and then pushing automatically. Uh, also, installation, reinstallation, as well as building and replacing the operator in place, or building and redoing the entire cluster. Uh, or iterating on configuration changes themselves uh, is another sort of sub workflow. And some targets just to aid with 
development, like watching logs and things like that. Uh, I, I haven't yet needed to actually iterate on Ceph code changes, so none of these targets exist. Uh, if you're excited about uh, writing these, please do. Uh, and I do want to introduce uh, Sebastian Wagner, who actually uh, has been working with Ceph code changes. And uh, I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, yeah. I'm Sebastian Wagner. Um, I'm the maintainer of the orchestrator, of the Ceph orchestrator. And yeah, uh, my development environment is a bit ad hoc. I'm using a project called um, Test Rook Orchestrator, which um, th its main purpose is to, uh, to test the Rook Orchestrator within a, a virtual cluster. And by coincidence, it's also working great as a development environment. Um, it contains everything that's needed to start up a, a, a Kubernetes cluster with uh, OpenSUSE Cubic, um, deploy a Rook orchestrator, deploy a, a Ceph cluster, and um, with KubeJacker, it's possible to on the fly upgrade or update the Python files or binaries within the Ceph, um, Ceph containers by using a, a local unsafe registry. Um, yeah, so, so the basic workflow is to deploy the cluster and then modify, the, modify your source code, uh, run kubejacker, and kubejacker will automatically uh, delete all existing running parts and uh, and basically automatically you have um, your code changes in your in your cluster um, Travis you want to come up so Travis is a original maintainer of uh, rook and yeah thanks Sebastian uh, thanks Blaine so yeah I'm, I'm Travis Nielsen one of the original maintainers on the rook project uh, it's about been about three years almost since we first created the repo and, and had the first commit. So I've had a little experience with developing on, on Rook, uh, and there are all sorts of ways to poke it, to build it, to, to run it. So we just have a few minutes today to, to talk about some of those, and another time we'll have to talk more about uh, how to poke it even more. So we've got about 10 slides worth on this one slide. Uh, so where to start? So first of all, uh, it's really important to have an environment where, where we can quickly develop, quickly iterate, uh, because building these containers, uh, starting Kubernetes and all of these things, it, it takes a lot of time uh, if you try and bring up a new cluster every time. So the first point I want to make is that 95% you know, of the time, uh, I'm using Minikube as the simplest environment to get Kubernetes running. It's a single node. Uh, it's really fast to start. You know, the first time I start Minikube, it's about five minutes. And from there, um, I can restart it really quickly, too. So I bring up Minikube. Um, I, on, so on, I'm using a Mac. So on my Mac, start Minikube. I use VirtualBox for my VM provider. You can use you know, any provider you want. Um, one of the first things I do then is I create uh, or attach a couple of devices to it. Since Ceph with OSDs uh, needs devices to start OSDs, uh, the next thing I do is I push the images that I'm frequently using. So, like the Ceph images, the Rook, uh, some of the Rook releases, uh, some of the different images. And once kind of I got my base environment in place, I will take a snapshot of the VM. Uh, so once I have, so I have Minikube with a snapshot, and and from there, I always have a clean environment that I can restore from a snapshot to start Rook again. So I install Rook, do whatever I need to do, uh, and install everything. And in a matter of minutes, I can restore the snapshot. Well, it takes seconds to restore the snapshot, but then it gives me a clean environment to, to test the next build of Rook. Uh, 
because you know, I'm testing different branches every day, uh, doing all sorts of different things in my cluster, and restoring that Minikube snapshot is, is the fastest way to, to iterate. Um, okay, so that's the first point. Find a simple environment that works for you most of the time. Um, and yeah, simple is good. The, so when, when we're testing in Minikube now, testing the changes, you know, most of the time I'm, I'm testing changes in the operator. And you know, we need to test, well, how is it starting the mons? How is it starting the OSDs? Uh, and when it does that, we want to start it in this, the simplest way that's going to let me validate my change. So we have in our manifest files that I use for development purposes that, that gives us that simple environment. Um, so these manifest files uh, in, in the Rook repo have the test suffix. So they're called cluster-test.yaml uh, or object store-test.yaml. And when we create those, it creates the minimal optimal environment for a single node cluster. There's no replication of the data. There's only one OSD, one mon. It just gets the cluster up and running. Uh, okay, so, so that's the next way to iterate quickly, have a simple deployment. And so when we do need to test with a multi-node environment and things, there, we do have a couple of documented ways to start up with like kubeadm clusters, uh, but it does take longer. And on my, my Mac, honestly, when I start up three VMs, it just, you know, 16 gigs isn't enough memory, so it doesn't work well. So I found other environments that, um, that work for demos where we've got OpenShift bringing up multiple nodes, and, and that just works with me. Fortunately, somebody else has solved that problem of bringing up a, a cluster where I can run that's not on my local laptop. Because a local laptop, really, one, one VM is all it handles well. Um, and then last point. So what I'm using on my Mac is VS Code. VS Code has a great Golang extension, since most of Rook is in Golang. Uh, and I can use it to debug the unit tests um, and do basic, basic development. So you know, I think some people might be using their, well, whatever your favorite IDE is. It's, I mean, just code. You can use whatever you want. But being able to debug the unit tests is, is a key thing. Because just um, as a last point, I think one of the most critical parts of this whole development process is saying, well, how do we know it's good code? How do we know it's good production quality so we can ship something that we know works? Uh, so there's three levels of testing, just to mention. So first, we've got to test it manually. We've got to see it working in my cluster. So second, we've got unit tests. So those are pretty simple, really quick to iterate. You can debug a test or run a test in seconds, at least, uh, and see it in the, the, your VS Code editor. And then third, we have these integration tests that you can run on a real Kubernetes cluster and see you know, it, all the components working end to end, as opposed to the unit tests, which are only really mocking everything. There's no actual Kubernetes running. There's yeah, so those three environments are really critical to uh, running Rook. Now, this is a really fast session, so feel free to ask questions. You know, we're on the Slack. Um, oh, next slide. Again, yeah, join the Slack. Uh, oh, come to GitHub, ask questions, love to answer them. And now we'd like to open it up for questions. So the question is if we're only consuming disks for OSDs. OK. So there, there are actually two modes in Rook today where um, in, our, in my development YAMLs, actually, we use the simple mode, which will create file store OSDs just in a, a directory. So that doesn't use devices. But this is just really for a test environment where uh, for production environments, you really want devices to test with. That's the supported mode by Ceph. So 
I guess the short answer is yes, it's possible to use that. Um, and I use it for development, but it's not recommended for production. Are, are you sorry, are you asking uh, how, how Rook locates the OS, like the disks? I see. Oh, okay. So there, there seems to be a concern uh, that the OSDs are shown having disks, but the the metadata servers, the the monitors are are sh shown as ephemeral, um, and so the monitors do actually store data on on the hosts, um, and so the monitors are like planted to a host specifically, uh, and then it will use that host directory if a monitor or a host were to fail, it's just sort of like in real life where uh, a new monitor on a different host would have to build up its uh, corpus, its mon map, and everything again. If, if, you, um, if you were to specifically want to put a monitor on an SSD, there is configuration within Rook to, to change the path where data is persisted. Uh, by by whatever daemons, uh, and that will that will also include like log data and things like that as well. The question was if you can move a mon ho mon to another host. Yeah, so for the, the mon failover, how about if we talk after, I think, about the mon failover scenario? But I'm having a hard time hearing, too. Yeah, I think we might want to walk around with the microphone. Yeah. All right, other questions? Um, I mean, this, this session, I mean, in my mind, is primarily for all, all of you, like especially if you're looking to get started on any of this stuff. So please, please do ask questions. Um, but like maybe as a show of hands, like who, like for people who are interested in doing development, are you mostly looking for like development on, on Rook, like by a show of hands? Or like mostly development on Ceph? Sort of both. <laughs> cool. All right. <laughs> Is it? It seems. It seems like there are no more questions. Okay. Well, thanks everyone, and we'll be here for questions up front. Thank you. All right.